I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Mongolia, 1973. A man travels on horseback through the arid Gobi Desert. He comes upon a creature laying in the sand, red and covered with scales. He approaches it, prods it with a stick. In a spray of acid and electricity, both man and horse fall to the ground, never to rise again. Oh, and b- before we start, when I got your message, I was in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at my my tummy in the mirror. Mm-hmm. I like I'm only one ninety, mm-hmm. six one. So I'm not like I could lose you, you just lose a few pounds, but uh, yeah. But my belly, I've got fat guy belly button. You've got fat guy belly button. Yeah, at one ninety and six foot. Yeah, it, my stomach looks like Force Whitaker. <sighs> God damn it! Uh, I, I'm I think what like close to two hundred, uh-huh. which is kind of a wild thing, and I'm like 511 or so yeah and i don't have fat guy belly buttons so i don't know what's going yeah. on well that's because you're polish <laughs> you're, you're dense you've got those potato bones i hate i hate the fact that that's the case i do have potato bones <laughs> but you know what they say the, about the polish no a lot of stuff <laughs> safe out <laughs> uh-huh I think it's your week. It is. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to My Chupra, My Cabra, and Me, the podcast where each week someone does a lot of research and the other one makes them doubt whether the time was truly worth the effort or just an escape from the unceasing thought that we're all hurtling towards an infinity of existential nothingness, pre-recorded live each week from our underground secret research facility in the scenic Hudson Valley. I'm Brandon Boyer. And I'm John Dunham. It's definitely not worth it. You can spend hours and hours of research on it, but the other person's just going to make a a billion and one jokes about what you've done and make fun of you for learning. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Actually, um, on the topic of of making fun of me for learning, actually, no, before Mm -hmm. that, even before that, I received an email from Janice in in Corrections. Corrections? Yeah, our Corrections Department. She's She's on floor three, sub floor three. And, so people um, are definitely going to believe that we have a Janice. Yeah. And I I also should point out, it's not spelled Janice like the woman. It's spelled Janice like Jan's box. Yes. <laughs> it's also not a woman. It's a man. Yeah. He's, he's very stern. Coffee. I steal all his coffee. But uh, Janice did, did contact me via private message. And we got two items wrong in the Red Cap episode. First is that Arnold Schwarzenegger gave birth in the 1994 movie Junior, not Mr. Mom, which was a 1983 film starring Michael Keaton. I should also note that the core reason that joke was even made was because Danny DeVito is in Junior, and he is a demonic elf that impregnates Arnold Schwarzenegger. (laughs) Yes. Just like a a red cap. Just like a red cap. (laughs) And you can take that home. That's a fact. It is. It is a fact. a fact. That's we, that's a new fact we recently discovered. Red caps do in fact impregnate weightlifters. They do, but only only like world tier bodybuilders who decide to get a career in acting and then politics. They're only attracted to Mister Universe, pretty much. The second and only other statement that we made that was not true in that episode mm-hmm. was that Arnold and Danny appeared together in the 1988 flick Twins. Not Brothers, a 2009 film starring Tobey Maguire and Jake Gyllenhaal. Wow. You can see how we got confused. We, we, we really screwed up on our Arnold Schwarzenegger facts. Like, really bad. Yeah. It, actually, we screwed up on not only our Arnold Schwarzenegger facts, but our Danny DeVito facts. They were all wrong. They were all wrong. They're, I was researching Scottish folklore, not Danny DeVito, so I'll, I'll, I'll let myself have a buy on that one. 
Yeah, but like I do, I there has been speculation that there might be a shrine to Danny DeVito in my attic. <laughs> so I see I, it. it's made purely from chewing gum. It's really weird. The weird thing, the weirdest thing, it was there when I moved in. Yeah. So there was some weird stuff going on. That, some body butter, and a knife. Oh. Three of those facts, two of the three facts that I just said are true. I'll let you determine which two. (laughs) There also, here's a fourth fact that may or may not be true. Uh There's also a basketball somewhere in the uh, insulation. Is that true? That is actually true. There was a basketball that was just yeah. chilling up there and a CD, which I threw out. Oh, what was it? I don't know. It, oh, it, it, it was there was a weird there was some weird stuff going on up there. And, and on the topic of making fun of the other person for learning. Mm-hmm. Do you remember last week when you said to me, I'd ask to show your work, but I don't feel like you have any work to show. Do you recall that? About the Mongolian death worm? Yeah. Are you doing the Mongolian death worm this week? There's a script, John! Of course. There's, there's always a script. A... <laughs> there's always a script. There's always a script. <laughs> oh. You know, this 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 whole me guessing what you're trying to tell me thing, that kind of... We've been playing this this uh, dog it's and pony show bit. for a while. It's not no. a bit. You're legitimately it's, guessing. It's It's legitimately not a bit. It's... Oh, man. So our mystery cryptid of the week was first seen and recorded in English in mm-hmm. 1922. It was okay. last seen uh, current, so the sightings are still still being made. Mm. Its regions are in the arid uh, areas of Asia, and its phylum is Annelida. Do you have any guesses on what it could be? You know, if you had said all that, and I hadn't guessed... I actually would have known that that is the Mongolian death worm. Really? It's a, it's a popular one. Yeah, well, because, well, not the time range, but the East Asia and the, the phylum, Annelida, which is yeah. a worm phylum, uh, I would have known. Cause I'm why do you sure know that? I had to Google that. Why do I know that? Why do you know that? Because I wanted to be a zoologist at one point. Oh. And I just know a lot of weird animal facts. That, that explains that's... a lot. <laughs> That's actually just what it is. I mean, yeah. that's that's part of the reason why I even am interested in cryptids. <laughs> Earthworms are in the phylum Annelida, and there's like annelids are just worm-based things, worm-like things. A lot of the time, they have like segmented bodies. I think, if yeah. my memory is correct, and they have like little bits. Yeah, no, that's specific and different from worms that have a collar. I know yeah. that because I googled it. I noticed that I didn't hear any clickety clackety typeboard crap going on. So you just knew that. I just knew that. Yes. You just knew that. I I did actually just know that off the top of my dome. Man. And I Brandon, I want to also point out, once again, it is not a bit. Brandon did not send me the file for this yet. So I haven't I haven't ha- I don't have the notes in front of me no. to make jokes about them. I didn't add it to our list of creatures to to uh to do research on. Nope. I did not put the, the write-up in the shared folder. I yeah. intentionally didn't mention it at all for two weeks. I actually I actually didn't think that you were going to do the Mongolian death worm. So. It seemed like a logical <laughs> next pick, and I was concerned you'd make the connection. But we were talking, and you didn't say it. You said, well, are you doing modern or folklore or what have you? So it was clear you didn't know what I was working on. Oh, That's, no. I'm I was impressed. Re- I was doing it because I was I was between two ideas, and anywho, we've talked about the fact that I have a weird psychic knowledge of things that you're picking enough. Yeah, let's get into the uh, let's get into the Mongolian death yeah. a little bit. I actually don't know much about it, other than the fact that it's a joke a lot of the times. Like people make a joke about it. I it, yes. I, I I know that there's supposedly sightings of it, but it's a common like internet message board like. And then there's the Mongolian death worm yeah, um, yeah. type thing. But that's about all I know about it. And uh-huh. I think I remember hearing like acid spitting or something along those lines. Uh-huh. But take me through this. Take me through yeah. this uh, wonderful journey. So the Alroy, uh, Alroy, shit. <laughs> it's Mongolian. Want to take a, want to take a uh, audible on that one? Yeah. Oh, I'm just going to put it in a pause and then edit it. So it seems like I nailed it. Of course you are. 
the Alroy Hoy the Alroy Hoy Hoy literally translated to intestine worm and commonly known as the Mongolian death worm is a creature found in Asia primarily the Gobi Desert which is located in northwest China and southern Mongolia American explorer okay. Roy Andrews went on an expedition to Mongolia in his book On the Trail of Ancient Man about his 1922 expedition to Asia during this expedition uh, he spoke with the then Prime Minister Jalkens Katgut Sadnomin Bamdin Bazar. That's a name. I spelled it phonetically. Okay, that's good. Before we go on, so it's a white guy in 1920s Mongolia. Yes. Doing this research. What's the over under that they're just fucking with this guy? They seem legitimate to him. There's a series of other expeditions that I read the accounts on, read the books, or watched the film. Mm -hmm. And there are various levels of them being genuine. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. I just, because always when I hear stories about a white person going to an indig like indigenous population, there's always the thought that pops in my head like, man, they're probably just getting back out of this dude. Yeah. Which I say, I say as a white man, that's fine by me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do that <laughs> to people from New York City all the time when they come to upstate. That's true. Yeah. You have told me num a number of stories yeah. about your fuckery. <laughs> Bam Din Bazar uh, mm -hmm. was a member of the Independent Party and Prime Minister. They have a series of Prime Ministers that all exist at the same time in Mongolia, and mm -hmm. they're Minister of each of their respective parties. Okay. In 1922, Bam Din Bazar described it as shaped like a sausage, about two feet long, it has no head nor legs and is so poisonous that to merely touch it means instant death. It lives in the most desolate parts of the Gobi Desert where we are going. The Mongols, to them it seems to be what the dragon is to the Chinese. The premier mm -hmm. said that although he had never seen it himself, he knew a man who had lived to tell the tale. Okay. it's So what you're saying to me is the, the Mongolian death worm is like, a legitimately legendary creature to the Mongolians. Yes, at least that's how it sounds coming from Bam Din Bazaar. Okay, that and it is a, a mythical creature that some people do believe is real. Okay, so that's actually a lot different than the the idea that I had for the Mongolian death worm. Because like uh -huh. for the longest time, I thought it was like some person who's totally joking, right? Like I thought it was like yeah. a like a, a swamp gas type thing or a, a jackalope or something along those lines where yeah. it, it, it's, it's this thing that people tell people because it's, it's wild or it's, it's, it's just a totally ridiculous piece of folklore. But if it's, if it's like something that is a part of the uh, Mongolian folklore, that's a lot more interesting to me to believe it or not, because then now it suddenly becomes a part of mythology and not just, you know, some random story that people on the internet pass around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And from the the Prime Minister himself, it seems like he's skeptical and knows other people who think of it more the same way as he says the Chinese do to a dragon. But there's also mm -hmm. a blend of people who believe it's real and have seen it. So it's, it's really interesting, even back in 1922, when there's a bit more tomfoolery going on, that there's a, a blend of genuine and actual folklore yeah. going on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's the same. The same could be said of like the Chinese dragon as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's a lot of mythological creatures that exist throughout the human experience that some people will view as allegory, and then other people view as like legitimate things. Yeah. So it's it's always interesting to see these instances in more modern times uh -huh. because it's kind of like a a wild, almost commentary on the human experience. Oh yeah. yeah, which I say I say all this on a comedy podcast, <laughs> and I'm being like really weirdly serious about this. But I feel like the Mongolian death worm is already enough of a joke in itself, like the name that it's been given. Yeah, but it's kind of weird. Like, well, that's the, clearly it, the the name that explorers and, and uh, European looking people gave to it. Yeah, it is called the Elroy Hoy Hoy. And its mm -hmm. actual written, even its spelling has evolved over time, much like the the powers that it said the creature has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. let's uh let's let's go a little deeper yeah. into it then. So Roy continues that the then cabinet minister stated that the cousin 
of his late wife's sister had also seen it, and that he had promised to produce the alter, they spell it different here, the alter Gorai Horihai, uh, okay. if he chanced to cross it in his journeys, and explained how it could be seized by means of long steel forceps used to collect it, and moreover, mm -hmm. that he could wear dark glasses so that the di disastrous effects of even looking at such a poisonous creature would be neutralized. Wait. So it's, it's so venomous. There's so much poison in this thing that just to look at it, it'll poison you. It's kind of like in the Men in Black, right? With the neutralizer. Oh, God, yes. Right? So, except instead of blowing away your memory, it just murders you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which I guess in a way is blowing away your memory. Now, there may be... Another reason why the darkened glasses would work, because there are other accounts that say that the death worm can kill people using electricity instead of or with poison. So it may be that the glasses are to block the light from any electricity being shot at you from temporarily blinding or stunning you. So is the Mongolian death worm a Pokemon? I didn't find a Pokemon, but did look for a Pokemon that matched its description. I'll be I honest. I figured you would have. I, oh, I yeah. figured you would have. I mean, the description you've given to me so far sounds like it was written by a 10-year-old. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, it's it sounds like a 10-year-old was like, you know what? I bet you this thing can, like, it's so deadly it can kill you if you look at it without sunglasses on. Yeah. I, I, I bet you this thing can just spit venom, like, you know, 30 feet. I bet you this thing can burrow through the ground or something along those lines. Yeah. You know, like kind of like how uh, some of the Pokemon Pokedex entries are like literally impossible. Like its IQ is is 900 and its brain continuously grows for Alakazam. Oh, yeah. It yeah. sounds a lot like the creatures I would draw in my notebooks in middle and elementary school. That invariably ended up looking like penises. All the time. Yep. So quick note about Roy, is that this guy's the real deal. He's a real Indiana Jones, except he <laughs> loved snakes. He led a bunch of expeditions, many in Asia, and he discovered extinct hornless rhinoceroses, which were eventually named after him, the Andrewsaurus, as well as discovering the first nest of intact full dinosaur eggs. He wrote books on all his expeditions and became famous for all his writing. He's mm -hmm. also president of the Explorers Club, from 1931 to 1934 until he became the director of the Natural History Museum. And Roy was an all-around badass. He also did not think the Death Room was real. I was going to make a joke about him and, like, the Explorers Club stuff, but the fact yeah. that he's, like, in charge of the Natural History Museum... Yeah. That, I was, like, I was like going to mock him a little bit, but this dude's legit. He's legit. <laughs> he's 100% legit. He went like, on all, all these expeditions... He collected stories and looked for evidence. He didn't find anything that satisfied him to the extent he would consider calling it real. So he he's 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 just he's awesome. Uh, nothing else I could I could say about him. He's an actual scientist. Yeah, because because that's what scientists do when they're investigating claims of a new animal. Yeah, they they go to if they go to an area, they're like, okay, so this is the description. Let's try and find evidence of it in the surrounding area. Let's look for nests. Let's look for live specimens, stuff along those oh, yeah. lines. Because that's that's zoology. Yeah, and he found all of that other stuff on his expeditions. And he does yeah. put his money where his mouth is. But he went there on his own, spoke to the prime minister, and went to where all these locals said they could find it, collected stories, searched for evidence. And he just didn't find anything that was satisfactory to himself. So this might be this guy might actually be my hero that I didn't had never even heard of. He's so cool. He's he's like, a real Indiana Jones. Like that's awesome. Well, also the time frame's right too, because Indiana Jones was active around that time. Yeah. So, I did read an article that claimed that Indiana Jones was based on this guy. But oh, really? When, when George Lucas was asked, he said it was not. But I do not know if that's because uh, he didn't want to get himself into potential legal trouble, saying that I based this fictional character on your actual adventures. Yeah, I could see that. But, I mean, everything that you're describing is basically Indiana Jones. Yeah. The next person I'm going to talk mm -hmm. to you uh, about is a Czech explorer and cryptozoologist named Ivan Mackerel. And he so, adds... To yeah? Czech explorer and cryptozoologist. I know that I'm supposed to 
be a little bit more willing to believe people. Uh huh. But if you lead with, I'm a cryptozoologist, I'm not as willing to believe everything you say. Yeah, that's 100% fair. If you lead with, I'm a cultural anthropologist who's interested in cryptozoology, or I'm a zoological expert who is currently investigating cryptozoological claims, I'm more willing to believe it. Yeah. But even though you haven't read to me his full description, I can almost guarantee that if he has a degree, it's not in any field related to cryptozoology. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Continue. Oh, no problem. Ivan Mackerel adds to mm -hmm. this, the description of the creature that its tail is short, as if it were cut off, but not tapered. It's difficult to tell its head from its tail because it has no visible eyes, nostrils, or mouth. Its color is dark red, like blood or salami. What? Wait, okay. So there's... You just read a bunch of things, and yes. like... Okay. I need to unpack this. Uh -huh. So, its tail is short. Yes, <sighs> as if it were cut off. But... So, like, as in it's, like, does it doesn't taper to a point? That's or how I interpret it as, is that if you imagine a snake, but where its tail tapers down, if that part was just cut off and rounded over. Okay, because that's... All right. It's hard for me to imagine a... Wait, are... are okay. Liter imagine a literal salami that could shoot poison. Okay, all right. I mean... Some might argue salami is a literal salami that can shoot poison, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, okay, continue, continue. I, I, I think I have a picture of it now. Uh -huh. It moves in odd ways. Either it rolls around or squirms sideways, sweeping its way about. It lives in desolate sand dunes and in hot valleys of the Gobi Desert, with sexual plants underground. Okay. Two, there's two things in that statement that have, are, are concerning to me. One, uh -huh. it moves in two ways. Yes. Okay, most most creatures that are like snakes or worms, uh -huh. they pretty much just move the one way. Because that's what they, their muscles are, are made to do. And two, sexual plants? Because <laughs> I heard sexual plants. Uh-huh. Is that what you said? No, I said sexual plants. So sexual plants is a type of plant that grows okay. in the Gobi Desert. So okay. it's a classification. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. I'm imagining a bunch of salamis just wiggling around in a pit <laughs> right now. That's uh -huh. that's kind of the the idea that popped in my head when I heard sexual plant, but I heard it as sexual plant. Oh, that's why I included it. <laughs> okay, good. Because that's the... This is the mental space that you've placed me in with this story. Oh, yeah. yeah. And for its, for its motions, the squirming and moving sideways sounds a lot like a sidewinder to me. Yeah, that, that, that was what I thought of, too. But it's weird because, you know, sidewinders tend to just sidewind. Yeah, the weird part was the it rolls around portion, which means it either lays straight and rolls to me, or it's, it's doing an actual fake made-up thing. Which is the hoop snake, mm -hmm. which I think is that American folklore or Dutch folklore. The hoop snake is, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's a uh, what you call it, one of those critters. Yeah. Right. So like like the hodag or the jackalope or the fur bearing trout. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the hoop snake snake is like firmly in those hoax that hoax yeah. classification. And for anyone that doesn't know, the hoop snake is a venomous snake that will chase you by biting its own tail and rolling like a tire. Yeah. So yeah. it's like a uh it's like an 18th century rubber. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. instead of ha instead of a tire having psychic powers, it's a snake that will just bite you and chase you endlessly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is possible to see it only during the hottest months of the year, June and July, later it burrows into the sand and sleeps. It gets out of the ground mainly after the rain when the ground is wet, and it is dangerous because it can kill people and animals instantly at a range of several meters. So it's a partially, not nocturnal, partially partially hibernates, comes out only when it's hot and wet, and its range, he included a range of several meters as far as its poison and or electricity. 
the description that he's giving of it, it's an apex predator, right? Is what yeah. that means. It's an apex oh, yeah. predator. Generally speaking, apex predators usually aren't the size of it. How, how big is it? I, I don't remember. I caught that. About two feet long. About two feet long? That's, that's pretty long. But the fact that it's an apex predator makes me think that it would like definitely have more of a presence. It would definitely spread to like the entirety of the Gobi Desert. You would think, right? Right? Like, like, uh, you know, I don't know enough about distributions of predator prey relationships too much, and mm-hmm. you know, I even though I have a passing interest in zoology, I haven't really been doing a whole heck of a lot with it in the past mm-hmm. two decades. <laughs> but that sounds like a creature that would be like really prominent, really at the top of its, its food chain, really hardy. To be totally honest, because it yeah. it doesn't have to worry about predators. It doesn't have to worry about survivability. It just needs heat. So the Gobi Desert is pretty much perfect for it. So, yeah. and if you can survive in one part of the Gobi Desert, especially you're in the northern part in Mongolia, you can mm-hmm. probably survive in most areas. Yes, there are um, active like ice flows and stuff. So it's a, a, a sand desert, the same way you expect, but it's there are cooler regions where there's just year round uh, ice and other areas where it's, it's fairly hot and um, you, you're at risk of exposure. Yeah. I mean, a desert's just the, the desert classification for a biome literally just means it's under a certain amount of rainfall. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. So Ivan, mm-hmm. he's somewhat less credible because he went on his expedition no. in 1990 in 1992 after reading the book Dune, a 1965 science fiction book by Frank Herbert. Uh, so in his um, in his writings, does he talk about spice or control of the spice or Dune God or, or worm gods or anything like that? No, he, he doesn't mention anything like that. Hmm. OK, OK. He, he I, did, however, mm-hmm. decide to try and catch the Mongolian death worm using the same techniques as described in the book, making a motorized ground-pounding machine and setting off explosives. He thought the worm was real. (laughs) So, when was Tremors released? Tremors was released, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the 90s. So I'm going to look it up so we don't have to do 2009? 1990. Oh, nice. So... Some of his descriptions also remind me of Tremors. Yeah. So this dude might have had a thing for worm-based medium, uh. like media, right? <laughs> so, like, maybe he just really, really, really wanted, like, maybe he, listen, maybe he had a thing for worms. Oh, I think this guy had a thing for worms. Like, what if he had a thing for worms? Because that might explain his behavior. And the motorized pounding machine. In 2005, Mm -hmm. journalist and zoological director for the Center of Fortean Zoology, Richard Freeman, went on an expedition, and he recorded it, and it's available on the CFZ YouTube channel titled The Lair of the Red Worm, CFZ standing for Center of Fortean Zoology. Okay. Yeah. Did you watch that? I I, I haven't seen it, obviously. Oh, I watched it. I'll send you links if you're interested. Okay, yeah, because I've read a little bit by the Fortean guys, like uh-huh. the Fortean Times and all that. They're definitely less skeptical than I personally am, but mm-hmm. they do give it a fair shake for the most part. Some of the they they don't all they don't always instantly go into belief, blind belief, from my experience. No, and I wrote the following bit in a way that it's funny, but these guys from the Center of Fortean Zoology did go in and give it their all. Okay. And they also didn't make any assumptions. And they also didn't cut the documentary to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Which is a positive, right? They weren't trying to, to add, like, zazz to anything. They were, it was just, we wanted to see this. We tried this. This was the result. So they didn't ghost hunters it up, is what you're saying. Exactly, Where, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because, cause like... I've seen episodes of Ghost Hunter when a chair moved and you can almost you can almost see the string. Yeah. So they, they added there were there was one area where they they added something uh and it seemed to me that they could have excluded it and the only reason was to make it interesting and that's mm-hmm. when a strong wind 
blew a tarp away and they had to go get it. <gasps> scandalous. Scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. As far as anything with zoology in the name is, uh, this one documentary that I saw is a, as legit as it could be. It's not any like the Nat Geo History Channel sci-fi uh, documentaries. That's good. Yeah. I mean, that's that's. I'll give him credit for that. You know, mm-hmm. his journey starts in Dalizit Dalzinzagad, where a ninety-two-year-old mm-hmm. man sends him and his team to a journey into the desert to find two people he claims have seen the death worm. On their journey, they come across a small group of nomads. One claims to have beaten the worm to death with a rock for fun. For fun? For fun. He asked why. He had, he brought an interpreter along with him, he and his team. And he asked if it was because it was on his path and dangerous or threatening him. And the nomad said that he had just killed it with a rock for fun. That he saw it and thought, eh, that'd be fun to kill. Hey, listen. Being a nomad can be boring. Right, <laughs> you gotta take you uh-huh. gotta take your thrills when you can get them. And let's let's be real, killing a Mongolian death worm, that's pretty thrilling to most people. But to a nomad, it's just another day. Right? Just another day. You, once you kill one Mongolian death worm, you gotta kill another one. You gotta kill another one, and before you know it, you're a Mongolian death worm serial killer. Yeah, because you're just chasing that high. They do make fantastic Mongolian death worm skin boots. That is true. Mm-hmm. I, I do assume that the entire party was co- like coated in the Mongolian death skin worm stuff. So they like had this red look going on. <laughs> it's pretty fashionable. <laughs> um, just from what I heard, you know, uh-huh. the rumors, the rumor mill mm-hmm. on Twitter and Instagram. Ah, and as they journey on, they come across a patch of tubers called Goyo said to be extremely poisonous and one of the preferred foods of the death worm, as it is the source of the death worm's venom. They promptly discover it is both edible and delicious, describing that it tastes as a cross between uh, celery and a banana. Wait, celery and a banana? (laughs) Yeah, I found that actually pretty interesting. I thought that was kind of neat. That's actually a wild flavor that I never even thought of, Uh and now I kind of want to try it. Yeah. It's right, that, I, I looked in the. I looked at Hanford. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't have any. Well, I mean, if it's a cross between celery and banana, right? Just just take a stalk of celery and a banana and just put them both in your mouth at the same time. Take a yeah, a really weird textured bite because <laughs> that's that's combining the the firmness and the crunchiness of celery with just the general mushiness of a banana. Yeah, and you know, personally, me, I have a thing when it comes to textures in my food. And I don't know if me personally I could do that. Uh huh. But if you're an intru- if you if you are a person who just has a wild palate and you try that, mm-hmm. let me know. Just, yeah. just in general, <laughs> I would love to hear that. And I mean, like, just at us and just at me in particular, and let me know how does that how did that feel? What did you do to yourself? <laughs> Tell me about this 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 horrifying thing you've done to your 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 sensibility. So this discovery that they made about the Goyo mm-hmm. already shows to me that they're disproving their own possible assumptions. They found it, they heard through stories it was poisonous and the source of poison. They ate it and found out that it's not poisonous, hopefully yeah. right away, and delicious. Yeah, like, it, it, it's always astounding to me when there's these types of claims that are like, hey, this thing is hyper dangerous and it will kill you if you eat it. And then no one tests if it's actually poisonous. Yeah. Which, uh, credit to these guys, that's oh yeah, that's kind of ballsy. I won't they, lie. They had a translator and a guide, and it seemed to me, they edited some of this out, but through context, it seemed to me that they noticed it, said to their translator, what is this? This matches the description of the poisonous food of the death worm. And then their mm-hmm. guide said, oh no, this is actually delicious. And then shared it with them, and they learned. Is the poisonous food of the death worm from, uh... Is that from the Ivan guy that that, that particular piece of information came from? Or is it from, uh, what's his name, Roy, the, the Indiana Jones character? I was not able to nail down the source of where it came from. Mm-hmm. But the Mongolian death worm folklore 
has mm-hmm. been around for a while. These are just the earliest English accounts. So it may be rooted in Mongolian accounts and got s- sort of dispersed within the American uh, folklore, but I, I haven't seen anything or one source in particular that clearly said, this is the food it eats, it's poisonous, and anything that stood out as being the first time that was said. Okay, all right. Yeah. Makes sense to me. So it's shortly after, they're traversing through all over the desert, by the way. They're going from point A to point B, all, all over. And shortly after that, they come across an elderly woman uh, who, by the way, was the one who had been leading them. Mm-hmm. And she stops to describe a worm she encountered on the spot where they stand. So it seems like she sort of veered off of their path that they were being taken on to say, mm-hmm. here's the area where I saw a Mongolian death worm. Huh. She proceeds to des- to describe a regular snake with no extraordinary abilities or features. And they, they also just, they're nice to her. But as soon as she's gone, they say to the camera, yeah, we're, we're pretty sure that was just a normal snake. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So these guys, again, they're they're on top of it. They could have super easily, like, carried that out. Yes, and at her and said... Oh, wow, that's great. And then sort of tried to spread and expand on it. But they were just nice, said, yes, mm hmm, mm hmm, nice. That's probably just a normal snake. That's pretty cool, actually. Oh, I, yeah. I'm actually, um, I'm liking these guys more and more. The more you tell me about them, the more I'm like impressed by their professionalism. Oh, it was rather impressive th- yeah. the way they, uh, they weren't, again, like you'd see on, on cable television. It was not anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually really would love to subscribe to the 40 in Times, but I tried to get a digital subscription, and it was like, this is not available in your company, your country. And I'm like, oh, I don't want I don't want a bunch of magazines just sitting around my house. Yeah. They then move on towards a frozen river. It's frozen year-round, and they bury a geocache and mark its location via GPS, and they actually tell you the location of the geocache they all sign it and sort of hide it so if you're in mongolia uh you can actually go and find exactly where these guys were they explored some frozen caves and didn't find anything but that is sort of neat that they're they're putting some geocaches out there yeah no that's pretty cool they eventually make camp near the chinese border and they decide to set up several bucket traps these are made by putting buckets into a hole that you dug into the sand and hoping that something just falls into them, that it, something running quickly across the desert will run, not see the bucket, and just fall into it. Mm, um, okay. It it seems the idea of a bucket trap seems sort of half-assed. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a it's just bit. bury a bucket and hope. They did show you how they set theirs up, and they set up a long series of buckets with a fine mesh screen along the tangent to the sides of the buckets. Mm -hmm. And their idea was that if there's, like, a quick running lizard, it would run, hit the mesh, and then decide, oh, I have to go left or right and actually run along this this temporary barrier they put up. So they they did something in addition to just burying a bucket that seemed reasonable. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yep. It makes sense. And along with those, they also set traps for small animals, hoping to catch potential food sources of the death worm. So they're... Doing real, like, real, like, I would not have thought to do that. They're actually doing real zoology, yeah. is what you're describing. Because oh, you yeah. need to have all these facts if you ever want to prove an animal exists, in addition to a specimen of the animal. Yeah, so they're setting traps for the animal, they're setting traps for its living food sources, they're examining its plant-based food resources, they're, they're really doing, I was impressed. Yeah, I, I've almost... Like I've done, you know, we've we've done some research for this. I think collectively we've done four uh, researching type things for this podcast already, and yeah. I have not found a single person who's done the amount of investigative rigor for their their work in the way that these people have. Oh yeah, most. By the way, so so to part the kimono a little bit, most th- research that I have found on the the topics I've looked at so far, people find the first paragraph of Wikipedia and then paste that onto their own website and then expand uh, with their own ideas. So the fact that these guys are doing this is insane because it's very hard to find good 
uh, resources and original source material. It really is. Yeah. So from that border, they traveled to a location called Zoon Mad and stayed there for several days, placing more traps and another geocache. And they also tell you the coordinates where you could find it. So I thought that was another cool thing that they're just doing as they go along. Yeah. Um, and even though up to this point they haven't found uh, a death worm, they've failed to capture anything in any of their traps, whether it be a predator in the bucket traps or a potential food source for a predator in their small mm-hmm. mammal traps. These guys are having a good time. They're laughing and, and they're doing research and just having fun. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. This oh, is yeah. a, this is a very impressive a very impressive story. The question then becomes, do they find anything? Ever. No, they found um like a broken down ruins of a old Soviet uh, encampment. That's pretty cool. That's pretty to neat. be fair. Like yeah. that is actually pretty neat. So yeah. I'll give them credit on that. That's that's a yeah. interesting thing to see. Yeah. And they travel to Toa Village from Zoon Med, where they speak with the governor and he introduces them to Kujienga, a woman who claims to have witnessed the death worm. And she claims that she witnessed it with her grandfather, who called her over to look at the de- death worm that he found. Mm-hmm. This happened in Zolgani Oasis, and that will be the next stop on their journey. All so right. They're, they're meeting with government officials and speaking with locals who are telling them, I heard it was here, or my grandfather saw it here, and then they just right away, boom, travel to the spot where the local told them that this death worm was. Uh, the expedition had no luck finding the creature, just in general, end, end of uh, documentary. They got to the end, and they had no luck finding it. They had no luck outside of finding people with stories. Hmm. I mean, yeah. but sometimes people with stories is is interesting enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it lets you into the, the local folklore and belief system and knowledge and in, in, in all of that. Um, Richard Freeman, by the way, the lead cryptozoologist, believes that the Olroy Hoi Hoi is simply an undiscovered reptile that is not dangerous, but simply misunderstood. So he's sort of halfway in between the first two people that we spoke about. He thinks it's real, but it's just undiscovered, and it, it all the stories are not true. I'd like to see uh, what the, what is it, discovery curve, or whatever the heck they call it. There's a, there's a term in zoology where yeah. all the species that have been recently discovered in an area are, like, you know, reported. I'd uh-huh. like to see what the like species new species discovery curves look like for that area. It would be very interesting to see. That'd be super interesting, yeah. Cuz cuz then if you look at those types of curves, you can potentially see trends emerge, right? So you can potentially see like, oh, yeah, there's probably a couple more reptiles that exist in this area. Yeah, you find that a lot with creatures that are similar to other creatures. But are the the different? They're slightly different, right? They're they're different species, but from a distance, it's very hard to tell them apart. To the extent that there are new discovered species, uh, simply because they realize that oh, this is actually different from what we thought it was, and that they've had them the whole time. Yeah. Yep. They. Uh, oh, we're. I mean, we're receiving a coded message. Oh no. From management. Nah, uh, I think they have something uh, to say. They weren't happy with us last week. No, they weren't. Two, four, two, one. Today's episode is brought to you by Quiet Liners. If you're like me and you drive around with a lot of junk in your trunk, fret no more. Quiet Liners is a patent pending, easy to install trunk liner for your car truck or SUV. What I especially love is that this easy to use liner covers that annoying little handle in your trunk so you don't need to worry about your cargo getting out on you ever again. Now back to the show. I'm slightly horrified by by how much detail there is to the the Mongolian death worm. Like there, of all the creatures. Yeah. <laughs> there's really so, there's really no detail on the death worm, outside of it's two feet long, has a stubby tail, and shoots poison. I just but, found a lot of people who really did some good research. Or just, not so good, if you're uh, Ivan. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, it's so wild that there's so much research on it. Like, oh, and the extent that people go to to get to that research, yeah. Yeah, next week's cryptid I've done the research on 
it's kind of a famous one. Yeah. And there's nothing on it. <laughs> like, it's like n- there's there's three people who researched it, but their research, their body of research is like, eh. eh. <laughs> so I'm just kind of floored that this cryptid that honestly, until today, I thought was a joke. Yeah, I thought it was a joke cryptid. I didn't think it was real. I thought it was a jackalope. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Uh-huh. Before this episode, before we recorded this, I thought it was a jackalope. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of floored right now and slightly terrified. Oh yeah, yeah. So it, it it's it's kind of buck wild. But anyways, getting back to the the story. Uh huh. The Mongolian death worm is an imp- incredibly popular cryptid. Many people yeah. believe in it, and there's many references to it. Uh, like you said, online and in different TV shows where it's more of a joke than anything else. There are many theories online of what the Mongolian death worm could actually be. Some posit that it's an undiscovered, highly venomous lizard, simply a non-poisonous, just undiscovered lizard. Some people think it's real. Others say that it's similar to an electric eel, and creates its electric charge by traveling through the sand, and it stores that energy for use later via discharge. I'm going to stop you right there. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that's not how the electric eel works at all. Oh, I'm pretty sure that's not how it works either. (laughs) I, I am also pretty confident that uh, the only reason the electric eel is able to electrocute things far away from it is literally because of the conductivity of water. Yeah, so so water, especially um, very salty water, is more conductive. And then there's this other issue of grounding. Yeah. It's, if it's building a charge to the sand, it's literally grounded. How would it shoot <laughs> the yeah. electricity? Like the amount of the amount of electricity that it would need to produce to like arc to something is unreal. Oh, yeah. Like 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 it would probably kill the creature itself. It or would have to I don't know how it would do that. Like cuz like like think of a Tesla coil, right? Like that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't know. All right. Uh, I'll 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 let that that point why i guess but so i'm doing i used to know this number off the top of my head but now i have to unfortunately look it up but there's spark gap so when you when you're designing circuit boards you have mm-hmm. to keep traces a certain distance apart from each other or route a slot into your circuit board to stop uh over voltage from from arcing from one mm-hmm. to the other so it looks like voltage equals what was it 3000 by I might just end up putting it in post. <laughs> hey, future Brandon in post here. We are looking at 30,000 volts per centimeter spark gap. That's the number I've been trying to think of. Or 3 million volts per meter. So I have a different idea about what the Mongolian death worm could be or the Ulroy Hoi Hoi. I believe okay. that in 1983, a tartar sand boa was shown to locals and they said, Yep, that's that's what it is. Hmm. So, so end of mystery. Yeah, I mean, if if <laughs> <laughs> So, wait. This is a thing, this is a thing that happened for sure? Yeah, this happened. So the Tartar Sand Boa is a <laughs> boa that is in the Gobi Desert and it has a stubby tail that could be confused with its head. Oh my god. Really? Like yeah. I'm looking at it and it literally does look like the thing that has been described to me. Yep. Like I mean, it's not as red as I was picturing, but like if if that exists and if the people who claim to see it say that this is the thing, yeah. And then Why is this even a <laughs> Yeah, that's what I think the woman was describing when she was talking to the Center for Fordian Zoology is she was possibly describing a tartar sand boa or similar snake in the area that also has a stubby tail. Oh my gosh. Like, like, 
now it now like everything makes a whole heck of a lot more sense because now now the story has become less of a this is a mythical creature and more of a hey kids you're being stupid around these snakes yep that's literally what this story has become now so yeah. let's create some fiction around these snakes so the kids stop being dumbasses yeah <laughs> yeah so uh. I, I believe the Ulri Hohoi is a combination of three things first is that it is just a snake and as such, people avoid it. It found that there was research done. People all over the world fear snakes, including people who have never seen them before or in areas where they're incredibly rare. And this is believed to be in part due to the fact that our ancestors who feared and avoided snakes lived to procreate and the trait was eventually embedded into our psyche, which Whoa. makes sense. Whoa. You talking about evolution? <laughs> You talking about natural selection? Yeah. Get that science crap out of here. <laughs> it's, it's science. People who aren't killed by snakes live to have babies. <laughs> yeah. No. You're definitely right. Yeah. It's just how it works. Yeah. And the second belief I have about this is a, exactly what you just said. That it's something people tell children to keep them from wandering away too far going out at night, being mean to snakes. It's just to keep kids in check. Yeah, I mean, that that's... Honestly, that's the most believable part of it. Like the boogeyman or, you know, taxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. The... Hey, man, taxes are a myth. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right well you believe that hit me back at the end of september <laughs> nah it, it's, i'll be fine i'll be fine i'll be fine don't worry about it <clears throat> uh, and my third belief about the mongolian deathworm is one of the first things you said at the top of our episode mm -hmm. and that it is a literal snipe hunt and for the uninitiated a snipe hunt is when your dad and his friend or an uncle or just some older guy has had a few beers and they convince you that there's a small nocturnal bird and you can catch it. All you need to do is wander out into the woods alone with a bag and a flashlight and make bird calls and it eventually just flies right into the bag. And, uh, of course, the snipe is not real and you're just an asshole. Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. actually, you're, uh... Your your drunk parental figure is also an asshole as well. Just to let you know, I like, can see myself doing that in in like three years. Just any I have coworkers who have kids, and I can a hundred percent see myself being at their house and going, "Hey, man, you know, if you take your pillowcase out into the woods with a flashlight and go, C -c there's a small bird. They're rare." But you can catch them. They're not too smart. So if you shine the flashlight at the back of your pillowcase, they'll fly right in. You just have to close the end real quick and you can see it. But you do realize that you are an asshole. Yeah. So you've just proved my point. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, it's one of those, it's one of those, you try to give me, you're trying to give me counter evidence or a counter argument, uh -huh. but you're just reinforcing the argument. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I think the, the Mongolian death worm, or the Alroy Hoi Hoi, is the Mongolian version of a snipe hunt, where a bunch of white guys show up asking about worms in the desert, and you go, yes, there are definitely worms in the desert, just go over there and you'll find them. Or, oh yeah, Bob over here knows about them, and you just send them to your other friend, and he sends them to somebody else. Which, by the way, is exactly what happened in the Center for Fordian Zoology. They're speaking to locals at dining establishments and bars, go to the point or speak to the person that they mentioned, and then just kept going from point A to point B to point C. So, yeah, like what I what I said at the very top of the episode, they're just screwing with the... The, the locals are just screwing with people who have no idea what they're, they're dealing with. Oh, or not yeah. not from the area. I and mean, I don't blame them at all. I don't, I don't blame them at all either. We do that all the time in upstate New York. Yeah. 
Like that's 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 a that's a a spirited pastime of upstate New Yorkers is just messing with people who are not from upstate New York. Oh yeah, especially in the fall time when people ask you for directions where they can find the prettiest leaves. Yeah, no, that's a big one. Yeah. Well, what did you do? Didn't you pretend yeah. that you uh uh to some like non uh non upstate New Yorkers? Didn't you pretend like you never had an apple or something? Oh yeah. To get like to get free apples from like I used New York to do City that. At, I worked at a farm stand, and there'd be the area where we live. People from New York City and other uh surrounding areas just frequent. Uh, for for one reason or another, including uh, there, there's a few people from film in the area, and they will show up, and they will buy something, and then you look at it and go, "Huh, you believe I've never even had one of those?" And they will buy you free fruit as long as you claim you've never tasted it. It's fantastic. It it's 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 a it's a nice hustle. Oh yeah, I've had a lot of free pears. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, jeez. It is worth pointing out, by the way, that outside of one or two people across all of these expeditions, going back through my notes, I believe it's three total. Yep. No one has ever claimed to have ever seen the Mongolian death worm. Not even the guy who had a thing for worms. Not even the guy who had a thing for worms. Everyone else just said, my stepsister's friend or this other guy over here. So there, there are outside of the the woman that said she had seen it, and the uh, the the one local, uh, the elderly woman and the local that spoke to the governor. I found no records of anyone having claimed to ever seen a Mongolian deathworm in person. Oh, and the guy that killed it with a rock, but I don't buy that. I think that guy was just having a laugh. Yeah, yeah. To be I totally think honest. I think all of them are having a laugh. <laughs> oh, I bet you that woman after she was done taking them on their expedition, yeah. died of laughter. Oh, yeah. That, so. The other important critical piece of information is that every person who claims to have had seen one or had a friend to have seen one saw it at least 30 years earlier. And they don't recall where or they recall where in very few details. I, I do try to keep an open mind and I have been trying to keep an open mind while I do these research things because like I don't want to, you know, just instantly shut down everything because that's no fun. But I think we've pretty much exhausted the fact that this is probably just a snake. The exaggerations of it are almost definitely just messing with people. Yeah, it's just a snake. It's a natural fear of snakes. It's people telling stories to kids to keep them from misbehaving. It's people messing with people from out of town. It, it's all of that rolled up, which eventually became folklore. And that's that's honestly what folklore is. Yeah, right. true. Like, folklore and legend starts as, you know, a bunch of people just trying to make it, right? And, like, survive. Yeah. It, it's like the early, uh, like, the monomyth, right? Yeah. So, like, the, 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 that whole notion of, Humanity just creates stories, and then we take those stories and we make them into something more. Uh huh. Yeah. But I, I I cut you off. Oh yeah, no problem. I was just saying that one additional thing I want to point out. I didn't bring it up earlier because it is not deathworm related, even though it came out of a documentary about deathworms. Mm -hmm. Is that the very last maybe ten minutes of the Center for Fortean Zoology's deathworm uh, doc? As they're getting ready to leave, they find multiple locals who claim dragons are real and have seen them. Um, uh huh. What? Yeah. So they're talking so, to one guy, and his grandmother apparently knows of a dragon that protects um a, a pond that's that's in like the next town over, and it's still there. Okay. And he's, these described dragons are more like large fish and protect water sources. Oh, There's so a... it's kind of, it's kind yeah. of like the uh the carp climbing the, the 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 waterfall, 100 waterfalls or whatever thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But these are real. They they or so say the locals who haven't seen them but know someone who has. Mm -hmm. Uh one man accounts that his grandmother had seen a dragon. The other says that when the Soviet Union was occupying the area, mm -hmm. there's one officer in particular who was a bit of a jerk. 
Yep. And that he did something to the well, whether I think he blocked it off or he did something to make it so you couldn't use the well anymore. And the well's protective dragon made him impotent. Ha! <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Got him. Got him good. Yeah. That... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's fantastic. I absolutely love that. And the timing was great because it was clear they were on the way out. They were talking to someone at a diner and they brought this up and the whole team it seemed like, wait, what? We're leaving. <laughs> Pretty much, right? Yeah. Like, like, oh, man, I would have been so mad at the locals because I would have just been like, why didn't you leave with that? Yeah. Uh, I don't care about the Mongolian death form anymore. That, that shit's probably a snake. Dragons? Yeah, everyone's got poison snakes. Talk to me about your giant flying water protecting fish. That that's a more interesting expedition to me. Oh yeah, a much more inter- like not to knock on the Mongolian death worm, but dragons are way cooler. Yeah, like way so cooler. much cooler. It's just that's just a like a fact of life, right? Like yeah. Oh yeah, like in a D and D campaign, right? Oh, yeah, you fight a bunch of orcs, some weird creatures. There's, like, a mimic there. But a dragon? Everyone wants to fight the dragon. Nobody wants to fight the dragon. Everyone wants to fight the dragon. Dragons are so difficult. (laughs) I love putting dragons in campaigns. They're super smart. They're super protective. Especially if you're kind of a jerk to the dragon, uh, because you think it'll be funny. Dragons are... Nobody wants to fight a dragon. Well, maybe that's maybe you need to stop being jerks to dragons, Brandon. Maybe, maybe dragons have to stop being so protective about stuff that isn't even theirs to begin with, and it's cool, and I want it. All right. Well, <laughs> we're going to agree to disagree, and the dragon that you meet next is almost definitely going to disagree. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so that concludes this episode of Cryptopedia. You can find us at our website, uh, CryptopediaCast.com. Our Instagram is at CryptopediaCast. You can follow us on Twitter at CryptopediaCast. We have a SoundCloud that is SoundCloud.com slash Cryptopedia dash podcast. Our email is CryptopediaCast at gmail.com as well as us at CryptopediaCast.com. We also have a Facebook group. It is public, so feel free to join it if you'd like. You can you follow me to- uh, What's up? Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So additionally, uh, that that Facebook group, it is you have to get approved to join it, but we'll approve pretty much anyone who joins it who is a bot trying to sell shoes. Oh, the shoe bots! You can follow me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb dot com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast dot com. And you can follow me at mu twenty fifty seven on Instagram. On Twitter, I'm at jf dunham. And you can email me at john at cryptopediacast.com and any other useful social media links will be uh, on our website. Our podcast art was done by Tom Hill. His Instagram is at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and you can email him at tommikehill at gmail.com. All that information is as usual on our website. Additionally, can if you could rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff on stitchers itunes or any other podcatcher that you might use that'd be great because it would give us a really great boon especially on itunes because in the early parts of a podcast existence those early subscriptions really help us and those early reviews super help us anywho uh i don't think i got anything else for this episode do you brandon nope that's it for me all right well i'm john i'm brandon and things are gonna get weird
Richard Freeman, the Zoological Director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology. And in 2005, I led a four-man expedition into the desert to search for this terrifying creature.